Um, welcome. Our next, our next uh, event is, is um, uh, gaming gamification as it applies to fundraising. The last session ended on a note that individuals are the tough nut to crack, and I think probably a bunch of us up here would would sort of want to reverse that and say that foundations and government are the toughest <laughs> nut to crack and that individuals should be easier. Um, and indeed, there is a, um, a big shift in fundraising culture um, across the board, regardless of what area of the nonprofit industry you're in. Uh, government is going away. If I would speak personally, I would think that we're going to see government go away entirely in the near future, and I'm not sure how much of a worthwhile effort it is to try to make it not go away. Uh, that's not because, you know, I don't believe that it, it has a valuable seat at the table potentially, but in terms of the practical uh, enterprise of where should we invest time and money, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of question there about, about, about government's involvement. Certainly foundation is here to stay uh, as a funding source, but it too is, is uh, very challenging uh, to, to crack. Uh, it takes a long time. Um, and one of the issues that we look at from the standpoint of resilience in nonprofit organizations is a, is a key theme that's come up several times, which is this idea of feedback. And the fact that one of the key elements of being sort of resilient, being able to kind of roll and shake with um, the environment and circumstances is quick feedback. And when you have to put a grant in and wait six months or two months or three months for a response, it causes an enormous interruption of the system. Uh, people in systems theory have actually sort of studied this and you know you want very tight feedback to have a very efficient system So the way that we've structured stuff in the institutional world um, Is very very conducive to kind of damage to the system overall Individuals we can have a much more immediate relationship with we can get feedback from them quickly classical development and fundraising has always been a quicker feedback loop with, with gaming and a lot of online technology it can be even quicker and that's one of the things that, that makes it uh, an incredibly seductive and also highly, you know, very potential uh, realm for stabilization and sort of uh, growth within the nonprofit sector. So that's kind of a little bit of a context, uh, not the only context, but a little bit of context for this conversation uh, with our panel this afternoon. And we're going to start with some comments from everybody. Um, I'm, I'm going to wear a little bit of two hats as a, as a fundraiser and nonprofit. Uh, professional, but uh, certainly not an expert in the things that these guys are experts in. Um, and uh, but I'll, I'll bring sort of the traditionalist um, standpoint to to the table, which was um, which was my um, reason for my sort of preface for the whole event. Do um, you want to talk a little bit first, Nathan, about your work um, yeah. with funding works and stuff? So basically, I'm here not from Game Lab so much, but from my part-time project and general interest in uh, Achieved Form and Funding Works, um, which is a crowdfunding functionality. I was talking to my friend Brad Euler, who's a leader in Startup Weekend and really interested in kind of small, agile projects and just as lean as things can be, and he works with a lot of people doing this and he's kind of getting to be a national figure in this. Um, we were talking last year about ways to raise funds for things that government used to do but doesn't do now, so we're looking at things like Philadelphia 2035 and whether things can be split off for crowdfunding and we had some conversations with people in the government doing interesting things. And then at a certain point, I said, well, this really, you know, if we do everything through the government, it's going to take a long time, it's going to be really slow. So we let it lie fallow for a little while. And then recently, I was actually I was talking to Thaddeus about um, kind of questions were frequently asked by people looking for funds, by the nonprofit community. and. He mentioned uh, crowdfunding, and I had been speaking to a lot of people on a daily basis about uh, how games could play. And on the one hand, there's serious games in the next session, but the other is gamification, like how can you use that? And it's kind of part of what drove putting the whole conference together. But I was further thinking about kind of I think, kind of taking this piece of gathering information, going back to what Brad was thinking, I was talking to Brad last year, decided, kind of thought, well, these pieces all fit together in a pretty interesting way. If we create a crowdfunding resource for nonprofits in Philadelphia. So the idea was to make it as lean as possible and to test gamification. And there were two kind of inspirational elements in the way we did this. One, for me, well, kind of Brad's attitude that we should keep things lean, and I really believe that, and I take a lot of feedback. The other is uh, Eric, uh, a game called uh, Cow, uh, Cow Clicker, and 
in which a, a, a well-known game designer got fed up with kind of the triviality of um, uh, social games in Facebook and that sort of environment, and he decided he would make a game that nobody would play, that would be so stupid and simple that nobody would play. And it would basically, you could cook a cow, and then six hours later you could click the same cow. And I think that a lot of functionality now is that same way, and it gets sold as much bigger and more complicated. But I was sort of feeling a little bit about that way about crowdfunding online, that you know, it's really pretty simple social functionality, and to build it wasn't hard, and it really didn't take Brad very long to build what we built. The other element was we really wanted, we did seriously want to test a lot of elements. And one thing I wanted to, and because my background's all games and marketing and like new game models, I wanted to test gamification elements. So I was inspired, if you go to the next slide, I was inspired actually by Carl Rove uh, in how we put together our, our, our funding model. And that's, I just thought, there, there are lots of ways to compensate people for giving or for kind of share, spreading the, the word. And I think that, um, <coughs> Launch Rock does something kind of interesting where basically they solicit people with a very simple page, sign here and get all your friends to put their emails in and then you get a lot of people to participate, you'll get early access to a website. I thought, well, that's not very good intrinsic motivation. That's kind of like, and how often are people going to really care about the website? And it's like you always, on these, on the Launch Rock entry pages, it always has very limited information intentionally because it wants to be a mystery. It's like the coolest thing, and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, so you put your name in, and that's basically what you get back is that. And I thought, well, what Carl Rove did when George Bush was um, uh, running, I think, for his first presidential term, the re election rules had recently been changed so that big donors couldn't give as much on their own. But he saw that big donors, if he kind of got them to package, donors together would give a lot more. And I thought that would work really well online. And he gave them stupid names like Frontiersman or some Super Frontiersman. And so we, we launched just testing with silver, uh, bronze, silver, gold. And that's something that would going to provide flexibility for uh, nonprofits to change and to change the dollar value. But essentially you get, um, if you, like my Asmeen, um, she only put $25 in. She gets credit for $715 in the system because she reached out to her social network and got everyone to put in a whole lot of money. So essentially, she can take that position higher. And this is kind of on the personal level. But where we were also inspired was in terms of how a sponsor, like a foundation, maybe one that takes matching funds now, could put $100 in and then reach out to their social network and rise up. So how can you put in a little bit and then use social network to rise higher in the system? So this is kind of like, this is our first task. And everything on, on funding works is really just a test because we make no money from we charge nothing to users. So this this first uh, project was from Tech Girls, and they're a local group that help middle school girls uh, get science, into science education. They have amazing classes, and they have outreach to like every tech entity. They do really cool stuff. My daughter, it's my daughter's favorite thing in the world. And they wanted to raise six hundred and fifty dollars in forty five days, and they raised in the first week they raised thirteen hundred dollars. So because everyone was, was interested in their initiative, wanted to push it out, and it wasn't quite the same dynamic because it's nonprofit, and it's kind of this, you're giving, uh, I think giving scholarships for the summer away, it's not the same dynamic as you face for um, and make, getting a movie made. And it does seem like one thing that we really are interested in exploring is the relationship of fundraisers to uh, a cause, and what makes them feel better about it. Because we feel like nobody really wants to rise up in an ostentatious way if they're trying to do it for good. You don't want to be seen as doing that, but to be seen as pushing harder and really trying to do better seems to have that. A little overview of your work now. Uh, yeah, so um, you know, with, with the Spruce Foundation, we, we, we have an interesting challenge. We have a very specific demographic that we're targeting uh, where we're trying to activate millennial next generation philanthropists, the future of philanthropy, but in, in a world where philanthropy doesn't necessarily equate just dollars, you know, action and uh, shared resources, network experience, all those things have equal weight and, and, and as well as content creation. Um, and what we were trying to do is how do we, you know, tackle that financial problem? How do we, um, you know, engage a community uh, that doesn't quite, isn't mature enough in understanding why it should be giving back to its, it, its, um, its own community? Um, you know, a lot of us when we got out of college are, are still thinking in that mode, especially now with the millennial generation, 
you know, college goes on, at least the mentality, another couple of years after. So, uh, you know, how do you kind of re-engage them or at least start what we call the, the arc of engagement? So I wear, I'm uh, like taking his term, so I thought he's his term here, like two hats, you know, my, my, my for-profit work, I, I run a digital agency primarily on, on creating advocacy, fundraising, volunteer recruitment, community building campaigns, um, and then also on the nonprofit side trying to like leverage these sort of uh, approaches. Um, you know, but the, the interesting thing that we, we sort of learned along the, the process here is the arc is a little bit different. So within universities, for example, the arc in which you get somebody to convert to becoming a donor is far longer than it would be if somebody whose child just got stricken with um, leukemia, the next day they become an absolute expert on it as opposed to being an alumni where you have to be cultivated and built and there's these stages and, and a certain number of um, processes they have to go through. Uh, so we spent some time uh, trying to expedite that sort of arc. How do you uh, understand, I'm using some jargon, but the ladder of engagement? Is anybody familiar with these sort of terms at all? You have a very specific process in which you need to get somebody to, they come to a happy hour, they met the executive director, they came toward the facility, you know, then they came to another event, they bought a gala ticket, they're a board member. You know, understanding that whole sort of process and how do you shorten that and provide a very valuable experience? And, and we did, a, at least in terms of use of game mechanics, um, didn't necessarily create sort of a direct and gaming environment. We didn't create an online environment, but we took the best practices of, of game design, incentive design, um, and understanding sort of the limited number of hours and things we're trying to get out of our base uh, for a gala, which was merging an existing fundraising model, the gala, big ticket uh, event, dress up, those sort of things, but applying it to how do you get um, uh, people to participate um, and not doing anything revolutionary, just changing the way that you would approach it, we set up a gala committee. Now everybody sorts creates the host committee structure, how that all works, but we built into it you know, a very specific kind of point structure, there was benefits and re uh, um, you know, sort of benchmarks we wanted people to hit. There was a very strong focus on the community building, so not necessarily creating a host committee specifically for this gala, but recognizing that the goal is to, again, plant that first seed in the larger arc of getting a community of people who are together. So we start with 100 engaged people. Within two years, you might have 10 left, but they are super connected and committed and understanding sort of that, that long tail. Uh, but specifically for this event, we were able to raise $100,000 more than we did the previous year. Um, we were able to uh, engage 300 more active uh, participants uh, to the gala. And this is like a $75 ticket item. You know, for a 25-year-old, that is kind of difficult, even though they spend the exact same thing at the bar on the weekend. It's not necessarily a direct correlation in terms of willing to you know, in, get engaged. But you have to have, especially from the executive management perspective, a very clear goal, a very clear sort of intention you're trying to bring together. And we did, uh, you know, we had potluck dinners you know, cultivating, like very specifically, we knew we wanted to have probably three dinners up, up until the launch, um, being able to ask people like, so what do you do well? What's in your network? Doing a, map, a network mapping session. So is anybody familiar with doing network mapping at all? Um, you know, you have a clear goal. It's like we're trying to get to the mayor's office. You bring people together and you whiteboard out all the different things you need to do in terms of your network, not necessarily going to his, his uh, chief of staff, but who are the people within your world that surround him from an organizational uh, dynamics perspective. So getting them to take ownership over the process, empowering them, not just leveraging them for a specific goal and a specific time and trying to engage them in the process, more of a philosophical than it was necessarily um, you know, reinventing tactics. So um, Fractured Atlas is a nonprofit art service organization. We're a national organization and we are member based. And our mission is to help artists and arts organizations with the business side of their work. Fiscal sponsorship is just one of our core programs. We also have a handful of other programs that include a low cost insurance program, which gives our members access to liability insurance that's much cheaper than what they would get if they went out on the open market to shop for it. So let's say that you are forming a board of directors and you need directors and officer insurance, we can help you get rates that are better than anything else out there. Um, we also, we have you know, every kind of liability insurance that you can imagine, but we also try to help with education for health insurance. So while we don't offer direct access to health insurance plans, um, at one time we did,
but due to the way that the health insurance market is at this time, it really we were basically offering the same rates that other you know other entities were. That if you went directly to the health care providers, um, the rates were the same. So now we're working sort of on advocating and educating about health insurance reform and trying to provide that sort of information to as many people as possible. Um, a couple of our other programs before I get into the fiscal sponsorship and the crowdfunding stuff. We also have a program called Artfully. Artfully is a ticketing software and it's also a customer, customer management database and it's open source. So any arts organizations that you know have ticket sales and need to manage their customers, it's a great way to you know sort of customize how you manage that and how you do it. Um, it's in beta right now, but there's a lot of new features that are going to be rolling out in the coming months. We also have a program called Spaces. Spaces is a database of performing art spaces. It's launched in about six cities in the United States right now, including Philadelphia. Um, Philly, Philly Space Finder is a place that you can go if you're you know, looking for a performing art space for rehearsals and say, let's say you need a specific kind of floor or specific kind of lighting or specific kind of seating, you can find it on there, sort of like Craigslist for finding space. Um, and then we also have some online classes that are sort of go at your own pace tutorials that include marketing classes, fundraising classes, um, professional identity, sort of you name it, it's in there. They're free and open to the public. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with fiscal sponsorship, fiscal sponsorship is a fundraising tool. And what it does is it enables individuals or organizations to come under the umbrella of a nonprofit 501c3 organization and use their tax exempt status to fundraise for their creative projects. It also exists outside of the arts, but I, forgive me if I keep speaking in terms of the arts. Um, so what that means is that you know, if you don't have 501c3 status, what you can do is offer your donors the ability you know, to take a tax deduction on anything that they're contributing to your work. You can also apply for grants that only a 501c3 can apply to. So um, through our fiscal sponsorship program, we really focus on the educational aspect of fundraising for our projects. We have um, almost 3,000 projects across the country, and they range you know, in all disciplines and in all sort of budget sizes. So we have one-time projects that are one-time projects that are being initiated by an individual artist, and they're just looking to raise five thousand dollars. And then we have organizations that are sponsored that have operating budgets of four hundred thousand dollars annually. And we partnered with Indiegogo, which is, as Thaddeus mentioned, a crowdfunding platform quite similar to Kickstarter. Um, they have the same sort of basic functionality where you can, you know, set your goals, set your deadline, add a video, offer perks. Um, all the sort of fun stuff that goes along with setting up a crowdfunding campaign. And you know, what, what we've found through this partnership and through watching you know, these thousands of artists fundraising through these is that there, there is a lot of opportunity within this model for there to be more happening than just these one-time transactions that are going on. So it's this sort of interesting moment in time, I think, from the individual donor's perspective of looking at, you know, these people are coming on to these websites and they're giving because somebody's directing them there. Somebody, you know, 80% of the time is telling them, this is where you go to give my, my work money. And that's where 80% of all of those donors are coming from. So, you know, the other 20% are being activated by those donors themselves or possibly by press that's, you know, paying attention to this. But there's this opportunity in you know, looking at this 80% and saying, how can we activate that 80% to drive people more to this site, to become more involved in it, and not just have it be this one-time transaction that they are visiting just to give money. Um, one thing that you know, Kickstarter has done an amazing job of is they've added this small gaming element that is you know, the all or nothing. If you don't reach your goal, you don't get any of the money. And what that does from the donor's perspective is it keeps them engaged. It keeps them coming back, looking to see what's happening, potentially um, making them want to get a second time because you know, they really want that project to reach their goal. And so you know, there, there's a psychological and emotional element that's not always there in the traditional fundraising campaign. And I think um, you know, while Fractured Atlas hasn't really solved what the solution is to that issue of how to get that donor engaged and keep them coming back and make them feel like they're, it's more than just that one-time giving. Um, I think it's a huge opportunity across the nonprofit sector to be talking about this on a larger scale because you know, in the nonprofit sector, typically our audiences do repeatedly come back. So we do fundraising, financial <coughs> management, um, board development, strategic planning, visioning, all whole systems 
for a monthly retainer uh, for organizations. And so in that connection, we do, we handle directly a lot of the fundraising uh, for our clients. And so a lot of them are, are very well primed and, and indeed need to kind of take advantage of this kind of system and are coming to us with very old fashioned development histories and systems where they send literally letters out. It seems amazing that people actually send letters in the mail to anybody anymore, but they you still know, work. people love still to get check. Um, <laughs> I process but, hundreds of checks every day. Yep. Um, but it is a lot of these, a lot of these trends and a lot of these things are shifting very fast and, and represent tremendous opportunity for the sector. And each individual donor has such unique needs and desires for how they, they want to manage their giving. So it's, it's more a matter of being able to examine that a little bit more closely. And we, while we have a ton of information on our donors, we haven't really sorted through it to look at you know, how many of them are repeat donors, how many of them are giving to multiple projects, how many of them are giving you know, monthly. So we, we do have like a monthly pledge system in place for our projects. And we do receive you know, monthly pledges every day from donors. But um, I think it's, it hasn't really evolved in terms of these arts platforms that are providing crowdfunding that anybody's offering that at this time. Well, I'd throw out too, that those are, that's something that we have kind of scheduled to test. Subscriptions, also finding ways to cover operating overhead, which is the kind of thing you can't get grants for, and how do we make that attractive? And something that, that Thaddeus has put into our bowl to test is um, if an entity is uh, in, a, in a situation of debt, but currently generating enough funds to continue to exist, is there a way that you can raise funds for an entity that then that its current healthy status can really thrive? I mean, it seems like there are a number of entities in, in the arts that, you know, at some point took a hit, now are operating successfully. Can we position that well? So we want to do a lot of testing of how, does, how do we uh, make different things that aren't like, I'm making a movie which is like a really easy thing to make as a project on Kickstarter, but like hard things. How can we do hard things and how can we get subscription to work? And we'd love to collaborate with, you know, with Fractured Atlas too, because we were talking and said, like, oh yeah, we should work with you guys, because <laughs> the data. And I wanted to ask too, like in terms of just different sorts of data, like, but you mentioned something that seems obvious to us too, but I wondered if you had more concrete data, like Indiegogo lets you cash out, get, lets a project cash out whatever money they have, if they want to. Whereas Kickstarter says, oh, you've got to raise this. And it seemed to us like a nonprofit might be in a better position to just take any amount out because they'd have credibility that they could do the project. Is there like any data on conversion percentages on Indie Get Well, you probably can't say that. But do you think that like is conversion of a successful project better on Kickstarter than it is on Indiegogo? And do you think that it makes a difference if it's a nonprofit, if it's a 501c3, that's kind of a different sort of an entity than an individual in terms of successful fundraising? You know, I, Indiegogo has not released data about all of their campaigns, so I, I don't know that information actually. Um, in relation to, to our projects, and even in comparing them to Kickstarter projects, so Kickstarter has released numbers oh, right. about sort of the success of their campaigns, and they've had um, only 44% of the campaigns launched on Kickstarter actually reach their goal. So it's only 44% actually getting the money. And they do allow 501c3s to go on their website to, to have campaigns. So if you're an independently operating 501c3, you can go on there and do that. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is they don't allow you to fundraise for operational support. You have to have a project that's going on. And I actually, you know, I think that the crowdfunding model is definitely something that people want to know sort of the outcomes of what is going to happen through the, the campaign. So saying that you're going to pay somebody's salary or, you know, um, pay the rent is not, it's just not as sexy and it's not as, as fun for people to be able to want to like share that. And I think it's a huge challenge for the, for the nonprofit sector that it, I don't know if crowdfunding is the place for that. Um, and, it, and maybe it's just that the models haven't really opened their doors to that. I mean, Indiegogo, you can crowdfund for whatever you want. Somebody was using it to um, crowdfund their in vitro fertilization. <laughs> so, you know, you can do whatever you want on there. Um, but there, I think in terms of how many projects are successful on these sites, like they, they really haven't released enough information to be able to say. Public radio, I think this morning or yesterday, began its spring campaign. That campaign is use media to ask for money for general operations without a project. Now when you look at the public television version of that, which also is a tremendous amount of money, hundreds of millions of dollars a year, being given by individuals, 
it's not only project oriented, it's after the fact project oriented. So you're paying for that DVD version of whatever. Um, you know, that incentives are, are segment specific. You know, that particular sort of practice it absolutely works within a particular demographic. But there's also new, like with the kind of the younger generations, you're seeing that without a sense of urgency, without a sense of, of tangible impact, you know, that can lead to lower engagement. So it's a matter of understanding where and when such strategies are best to, to apply. And I definitely see relevance. I mean, especially radio, because you have such an intimate relationship with it, like WHYY, that, I mean, you feel like you know everything you're putting money into. And it's like, it's constantly there with you. So it's, I think they have a fairly easy ask. You know these people. And I mean, I think that kind of more proves the point than it's something really different. And television is, if it's, you know, I think that so much of Kickstarter now isn't just help me make this movie, it's help me make this movie, send me $20 and you get a DVD. And it's kind of like, it's effectively like a pre-order system. And so, I mean, they don't have that and radio does. It seems like it speaks interestingly to the difference between the media and also of kind of the, the primary importance of transparency and intimate contact. Uh, the implication of getting people engaged in community and with organizations and then now we're talking about getting those donors, but like, where do we cross those two lines together? Well, we're engaging with them through games socially, but then we take them through the arc of engagement and go, they become part of our organization. I think it's, it starts, like, it's in terms of, I'm trying to give a tangible actual example, but it really does start with, as the organization, understanding the roles you need to fill, um, but also letting, and not building those roles in a vacuum. All right, so a lot of organizations take the tendency of being like, I need volunteers, I need donors, I need this, and they have very specific ideas of who those people are without, and they project those buckets on their community and then wonder why nobody's participating. You know, so uh, the real thing is being able to engage and learn from your community and evolve and, and really adapt to an iterative um, sort of model. Uh, obviously driving towards goals, but you have to have uh, a sense of sort of what are the different roles in which somebody can participate in your organization um, and, and really create, you know, the structures to do that. So for example, if you're looking to cultivate volunteers, you know, that's a very particular sort of strategy and arc that you're trying to walk people through. Um, and, you know, it is a little abstract, but it is a matter of, you know, trying to empower them with a process of self-discovery. You know, they need to discover on their own that they want to, they want to volunteer, they want to do these things. It's just a matter of the organization to create all the opportunities for somebody to do that and then guide them properly without like sending a million messages a year. You know, how many times they engage our community, how many times uh, they, uh, um, you know, they, they posted up events or, or, or opportunities to, to participate in, or, or they put out a report or showed data, like things like that are all kind of measured. And at the end of the year, it's like, well, it's clear who deserves grant money because you're taking the steps to really cultivate a strong community. And it's no, and it really, it's kind of built in inherently. So it's even sustainable on our side in terms of where we allocate our funds. Nobody has said, nobody kind of in the nonprofit area has said that Kickstarter is great for them or that Indiegogo is insane. That, there doesn't seem to be a perfect solution, so it's still so, somewhat in flux how to fund these sorts of things. Um, but I think that, yeah, I think it, it's kind of, it's, it's almost in looking at jobs, it's interesting because nonprofits are already sort of there because they can fund everything that for profit entities will be able to fund probably in about a year. There'll be a year before Jobs Act anything ha is happening with that because it's got to go through several layers of approval. And I've talked to lawyers and they've timed, back timed it for me, and it's probably a year. So if you look at what you can do with nonprofits now, you could fund the whole thing, you could do what they can do, but so, so it's interesting, advance access to this resource that for-profit entities will have in the future, and you could do now. Mm -hmm. so. Is there anything that anyone's developing just for nonprofits that may not, maybe like in the region, say, um, where maybe you're not a specific grantee of someone, but other foundations could, you know, go on and look and see what you're doing and kind of have that trackable, measurable um, dynamic that you were talking about where you'd say, you know, we had this event and this many people. That's not, you know, because you do it on your own website or you do it in your own private records and you submit them to the foundation when they want to see them. 
But as far as just kind of getting the word out, I feel like not enough of that's disseminated. And, um, you know, foundations are so kind of, a lot of them are really kind of used to getting their referrals from the board members and some of them don't accept applications. And you can go on the Foundation Center and you can go on the Pennsylvania Foundation website and search for them and try to make your inroads. But I think that like if there was something that existed where you could, you know, even earn a badge for like, this is a great volunteer organization. I like the feature ideas that you're talking about, like the results as a way to do it. The only problem is with that is if it's, the tool would be great, how you integrate that on an administrative level within the organization so it's not an additional burden mm -hmm. to the staff which is already stretched thin is, is your real challenge. So if you can find a way to integrate it as a tool that they use in their day to day that could then support uh, board reporting or anything else that happens to it, where it, all, it reinforces sort of their, the, um, the transparency, that would be phenomenal. Crowdfunding fatigue that, you know, every, everybody who's in the arts, the arts community is speaking just about that as an example, you know, is relatively discreet and, you know, I get probably three to four Kickstarter campaign emails, you know, a week, mm -hmm. um, you know, for all people, for people that, you know, I like and want to support their projects, but, you know, how, how far can you go? And um, it also starts to erode some of the, some of the, um, the kind of engagement and value propositions there. And so what Nathan's working on with Funding Works is, is a little bit more in the direction, but what is sort of crowdfunding 2.0 looking like? What's the, what's the view around the corner from where we are right now? <laughs> well, I mean, well, on the one hand, the, the arts are very specific, and it was the big early win with Kickstarter. So, but I think that crowdfunding in general is more a ubiquitous device than it's like something you're going to get tired of. It's like, oh, I really care about this, I'm going to kick money into it. Ordinarily, maybe someone would be giving out, you know, selling chocolates, or a kid would be doing stuff. You know, we're doing one thing with a uh, school that, uh, with Science Leadership Academies, that project's going in this week to fund buying computers for next year. I mean, that's not the same sort of thing, the same sort of ask as, you know, a creative ask. It's, you know, their community, other, the larger area that are interested in this project and how all that goes. So, I mean, I don't see, like, I don't, I just don't think that there's any exhaustion that comes into play with this. It's just that people are, this is how, I mean, I've had conversations with, I think, uh, certainly David and, and Thaddeus about, you know, the nature of small nonprofits in Philadelphia that used to be they have a board and the board was responsible, they'd reach out, you know, they were wealthy, they had friends, they'd reach out to them. And I think that now it's much more open and people have do have networks, but they tend to be online and you can reach out much further. I mean, with uh, tech girls, people were kind of, all kinds of interesting tech figures on the West Coast were saying how great tech, tech girls is and that they'd like to participate. So again, I just don't think that unless you, you just keep getting requests to fund bad art or something, I don't think that it gets tired. I would say, like, if anything, it gets, it's already quite local. You know, it's already very community-based, but I think there'll be, uh, as, as things get more localized, I think there will be, that's sort of like the conversion of it. It's taking it from the general overall platform to something that's much more accessible and tangible within your own community. Where it becomes standard practice, you know, you're not really this, the your your acts aren't going to be, you know, you're not going to be inundated all over the place. But you'll have a pretty traditional understanding of where they're going to come from from, uh, from your friends and your community. Gotcha. I also think the market is not really saturated at mm -hmm. all. Like if I've been speaking all across the country for the past couple of years, and it's amazing to me when I enter rooms that have a hundred people, and I ask, you know, who knows what crowdfunding is, and it's like five people raise their hand. So um, there's a lot of people that haven't been approached or haven't really been targeted. And while in the arts community, I also receive four to 10 asks a week from people that want me to donate to their projects. Um, my sister in Florida has no idea what Kickstarter is. The last time I mentioned it to her, she's like, what's that? So it's definitely something that um, there's, a, a, I think, a lot of room. And I think there's a lot of room for a lot of players. You know, outside of just Kickstarter and Indiegogo, I think that there's a lot of new organizations that are starting up platforms that, um, either specialize in specific fields or they're specializing in specific communities and I think that that's sort of the strong suit of where it's headed. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that in terms of donor engagement and audience building that that is going to be the sort of sweet spot where people actually are able to build a vibrant community. Um, also just talking to um, you know the, the younger generation of people that are online constantly and are used to earning badges and doing all this stuff. For them as they come of age to the point where they're actually able to give 
um, probably it'll be so ingrained in them at that point that they're um, part of these communities that the communities are only going to grow from there. So yeah. um, do you see? Do you see? Where do you see the regulators for the nonprofit sector? How do, how they're relating to this? Is there is there you know a positive trajectory? Is there sort of, are there some sort of bumps in the road that may be ahead of us in terms of in terms of that whole area? I mean, I think that there could be. I think there probably hasn't been too much scrutiny at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I think especially from you know individuals' perspectives who are coming onto these websites and they using. Don't care. They, they don't understand the tax implications of, you know, all of a sudden they just got $10,000 from Kickstarter and they don't recognize that that's income and they have to file it on their taxes. So it's this, you know, I think that there probably will be a movement towards providing more education to users of these sites because right now there, there's not much. Right. If you ask any of these platforms, how do I deal with this? They just say, you should ask an accountant. They won't give you any sort of indication that it's actually taxable. 